Okay. And we're on. Hi, welcome back. I'm Madeline Cronenberg. I'm Consuelo Lara. And this is Between Two Teachers. And we welcome you once again from the holy land of the Chochenyo Karkin Ohlone people, where, uh, where we're broadcasting from here in West Contra Costa. And I do want to read this one more time, the uh, uh, In La Kesh, the centering prayer of the Mayans, which says, you are my other me. If I do harm to you, I do harm to myself. If I love and respect you, I love and respect myself. It's the Mayan point. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about what's happening in education, and there's lots of stuff happening uh, nationally uh, and locally. The big news that, that everyone is, is uh, focused on is reopening schools. And reopening schools uh, is being, the conversation is just being started everywhere. I put here, this is, I've, I've shared with you a Trello board that uh, will be linked to in all of our, uh, linked to as the resources for this uh, episode. And on this Trello board for today, 626, um, I've included all of these materials. And what I wanted you to know is Pasadena Unified, I think is ahead of the curve because they have their presentation and they did a presentation. And if you want to see how they are looking at uh, bringing children back four days a week, having uh, Monday for them be their all virtual day district wide. Uh, if you, when you see this card, this is Pasadena Unified. If you click on the card, then you get um, links to their materials. And this is a link to their PDF, which is the, you know, the PowerPoint that they presented. And there's also a link to the, the uh, YouTube video of the entire presentation. And I, my opinion is that this is what every school district probably in the United States is going to wind up doing. And for whatever reason, um, uh, Pasadena is one of the first ones to put it out there as a national model. So um, I suggest that you take a look at it and it'll give you a, an idea of how they're looking at uh, just handling it. We're talking here about handling the physical aspects of health and social distancing and, and delivering distance learning all together. Like here they are, they're talking about doing it. It's interesting. I've been told by El Cerrito High folks who, um, have block scheduling and have gone, had lots of, of different conversations around block scheduling over the years. Uh, they've been approached by people from all over the country about how they do block scheduling. Because here in uh, Pasadena, for example, they're gonna put their uh, high school students, this is the high school uh, option, on three blocks a day. So everybody's moving. That's what they have to do to, to uh, in terms of, of uh, trying to limit the number of contacts that children and teachers have. This is just high school or elementary? This one is high school. But they all, they've got, the, the report is for everybody, elementary, middle, and high. This particular slide is high school. Do, do they include the things that we were talking about, like looping? They don't talk about that, do they? No. And looping is, I think, in terms of the educational choice the most important one that people can do because that even if you're all online you're better off being all online with the teacher you just had right so i think emotionally if there's some way to do it i understand that not every teacher is ready to move up or move down move up a grade and that's what we're asking everybody to do is move up a grade and these are teachers who've had years of developing we're asking them to develop a new way to deliver a curriculum and that is a new curriculum so i get that that's problematic but maybe there's a way to co-teach that you know it's, but I, there's not even discussion about it unfortunately and it's so sad because it's you know it, it i think it would serve so many needs of the 
the families and the students needs as well as the teachers needs it would <clears throat> like i said i did it inadvertently at at uh, helms when i had the other ones and twos and i'd have the kid the next year it was wonderful it was really wonderful to have them so we need to keep advocating for looping to be to show up in here because i didn't see it i mean it may have been mentioned and i i should go back and re-listen but yeah. it's certainly not one of the main focuses where it really could be you know, in, uh, because we have a task force working on you know the same thing um and the thing that keeps coming up through their surveys two things one is engagement the second one is social emotional so the looping addresses the social emotional absolutely well i right. i think it, it, it addresses engagement because they, these are teachers then who are going to call otherwise you have a whole new a teacher who's meeting a group of people virtually and has never had a relationship with them as opposed to the teacher who did right and I just think there has to be a way to be able to have teachers partner with each other and co-teach with the class that you had last year. So you don't have to lose all of that continuity and that relationship. But it needs to be intentional because otherwise it's not gonna happen. Um, so this is, this is that, this is that the district, a typical district strategy. It's very good I and mean, obviously it, they put a lot of time and effort into it, and I I, uh, I recommend to you if you're interested to watch the uh, the presentation or just take a look at the PowerPoint to see how Pasadena is doing it. Uh, the other one is the next one is from Journey for Justice, which is a uh, an organization for social justice in schools, and they've made some demands, and I've linked to those demands as well, and I'm just going to go quickly through them, but you can see that this is a different emphasis. This is a social justice emphasis to reopening, not just the uh, wash your hands and, and maintain social distancing kind of thing. So this says uh, there are eight, uh, eight demands. Uh, no child can fail or be suspended. Just take that pressure away. Take that pressure away. Stimulus funding should ensure that every child has the computer and access to the internet that that the equipment is there it's provided that there be a federal mandate to stop school boards from closing schools and approving new charter or voucher initiatives and a national moratorium on new charter schools that of course is not a part of any school district's plan but that is certainly an appropriate social justice uh, effort yeah for sure. right we're we're very much behind that right as, as is the california democratic party who passed a moratorium on on uh on new charter schools uh then there's uh, elimination of punitive standardized tests for at least two years absolutely important and we've talked about that here as well so this is a as a social justice measure elimination uh, stimulus investment of 75 billion for community schools, elimination of voter suppression, immediate decriminalization of students of color and school cultures with the implementation of restorative justice. And their final one is that the federal government form an education equity task force that monitors inequity and brings recommendations to the Department of Education and Congress this is what we need to be moving forward on and uh I, I commend it to your attention and i really think that every everyone who's interested in issues around justice that have come up because of all of the demonstrations that we've had recently this is the list of things that need to be done and not just left behind this is what we're the actually the california school board association should endorse this this is the platform that needs to be endorsed right here for schools if you support schools this is justice in schools so there's that uh then uh this is just the one that the cdc has put in where it talks about how to, how to open this so this is what the, the the federal government right the center for disease control but this is the main thing they've talked about and they're just talking about safety guidelines and uh, uh, whether or not there you have the monitoring guidelines. But this 
so the federal government has none of the, the neither the state nor federal government has looked at the justice issues and that's sort of one thing i wanted to point out so as much as we're going to figure out how to do social just uh, social distancing and how to wash our hands and 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 even distance learning the justice issues need to be given the same amount of attention and right now they are like kept in a separate pot right and and they they're being siloed and i th think it's really important that we see that they need to be right there next to them all right That's good. next go this ahead right now in the middle of uh, our task force you know meeting often to put that plan together because it's due i believe the middle of july and so it's uh it's coming up and those issues we've got to really um that's right your draft is due to the board i think on july july 11th and then you have to give the draft the final to the county on the 20th yep yeah right so everybody is busy putting them together but they're not putting in any of the social justice uh impacts and and I, and that would be useful maybe you want to bring that over to them and say you know we should pledge to to uh, agree to approve these uh, just making a list of people that i'm going to forward all of that stuff to and then we can have some discussion about it right right so all of these are right here so for this for example when you get to a card if you just click on the card the material is on the back of the card including the links easy to share to easy to share pass on to others you can just copy it and you know share it out however you want to share it out download it and it'll have a link that's good that's good well um one thing i did this week is um i went to the um uh lmi it's called the california labor management institute and i went for the first time last year and it was just uh very eye-opening it's um you know they want to build partnerships uh between labor and management and the the bottom line of it was that when you have good strong healthy relationships between your management and your labor you get results from students you get academic you get improvement so um and they, they have some core beliefs that i thought were really important that education can transform communities through collaboration and trust through transforming the culture through diversity and inclusion and equity and also comprehensive unionism so really valuing our unions and i thought all of those are key and i like them because they're very positive they're not you know lots of times we see a lot of negativity and hostility but this is something that we can all work together as professionals and so talk about transforming culture their keynote person was um dr um pedro Nogueira, and he's a long time education uh leader and uh in his presentation one of the things he talks about is a paradigm shift we still <laughs> to understand we're not going to go back to school as usual so exactly thinking, I, I think everybody's still thinking how do we make it back to where it was even online we've got to use the same curriculum which right. we used. you know we've got to also look at the project you can't have all of everything on the screen you've got to do project-based learning and a lot i guess a lot of teachers don't know how to do that or what that is maybe we need a lot of training we need conferences we need um workshops on what that means at different grade levels for different content areas exactly exactly the paradigm because if we're going to abandon standardized tests which is exactly what we need to do then we have to put something in its place this fits perfectly so when we talk about transforming the culture, that mind shift that has to happen, he called it a paradigm, a shift in paradigm. Uh -huh. Paradigm is more than a program. It's rooted in your beliefs and about what is possible and what is needed. Right. So here are the points. He feels we should go from measuring and sorting to developing talent in all children. So we're not gonna test them to death and then label them, sort them, and stigmatize them. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna develop the the talent the natural talent in the child and i would think of that when i would see the kids at helms and i'd look at them gosh these kids are so smart they're in, you know they got street smarts they've got 
they just have this perspective. And I always, always thought, and of course, it's not going to show on any stupid test. And they're going to still be labeled. But they were, a lot of them are just, you know, just um, insightful. They should be in gifted and talented programs, um, higher level thinking skills, critical thinking, and all of that. Another point was the pressure and competition from pressure and competition to collaboration, curiosity, and encouragement of intrin intrinsic motivation to learn. And I remember that's, that's the goal you want, the, right. the love of learning. And teachers know how to teach that, that curiosity and plug into that. When they don't have to stress about tests, test scores, but they can really get to the core of what it means to teach and learn and the love of learning. The next one was um, to go from assessment to assessment to rank, which we were just talking about, to assessment to guide learning. And that's where the multiple measures comes to we. I remember somebody telling me when I got on the board, well, we gotta get more data. And I kept asking for what, for what? Is this data gonna help me be a better teacher? If it's not, useless. Right. Um, and so in our department, we had multiple measures and we talked about the students and we, um, it's like it was individualized. Okay, here's what this kid needs based on what we see as teachers. And we've, we've got our own assessments. And so we need to guide the learning. Assessment has to guide the teaching and learning, not you know, compare them to people who uh, have more, um, you know, more privilege. And then we say, oh, these kids are not performing. It's unfair comparisons. Um, and then ask also from teaching as covering the material to teaching as cultivating a love of learning. Very big difference, very big difference. I mean, I remember that feeling. Oh my God, I gotta get through this book. And I want to do more. And I want to cover two years in one. I mean, I right. just was determined, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> and of course you can't, you can't. And, and then the poor kids, you know, it, it's, it just doesn't work. Um, but if uh, there was a time we could teach and get excited about it and have projects. And then the last point is going from parents as consumers to parents as partners. That's a big one. That's a very I think one. this has happened much more now, the COVID-19 distance learning model where parents have had to have much more input has uh, opened the eyes of many parents in terms of what, what it means to be a partner in their children's education. Oh, I know. You know, this is, there are many people now talking about how it never, they had no idea how difficult it is to, to go through the learning process, how the steps their children needed to go through to, it just, they were, what they were used to doing is dropping them off at the door and then picking them up. And meanwhile, they would have learned everything, right? Just going back. So now they now they had to go step by step with their children, and that makes them partners or helps to make them partners. Uh, going back to looping for a minute, like I said, when I had kids for two years, that was one of the big perks. the The parent trusted me, and they would call me or come by, and they felt that comfortable. It has tons of perks. Looping has a lot of perks. There's just one year, you know, they gotta you gotta build that trust. You gotta so. Um, yeah, so it helped with that partnership for sure. For sure it did. So that was, I uh, just really enjoyed going to those. Oh, and then the other great workshop was on um, specifically on project based learning. Uh -huh. It was so fun. So there was a diagram of putting all these topics in the middle, and, and they started with butterflies or plants or how about civil rights or Black Lives Matter or COVID or all the things that are happening right now. And then around it was, okay, the science related to that, the history related to that, the math, and all right. of that. And that's exciting. And, and if you let the child choose what their topic is, and of course you're guiding the content and skills, but you let that child, they're gonna be excited. I get to do this on butterflies, or I get to do this about Black Lives Matter, and everything I'm doing, relates to it the math the science the history oh my god they would get so excited about about learning and then right. you as a tool just to look stuff up 
in there. So that's what we got to do is really talk about engagement. That's where the engagement would happen. So I'm going to talk more about that and bring it up. And I hope we find more information that we can share with the district. And it's just really something we need to. It needs to, the changes need to be made a lot of different places. I and mean, one of them is in, in, in the, um, in, in the uh, programs that train teachers. Yes. Oh, yes. Right. Yes. I mean, because they're taught to do something different. And yes. honestly, now that I think about it, one of the things that could be within those programs is to be taught to do looping. Yes, yes. That's really where you start it. But if we said, you, well, you know, you could be with your children for three years and here's what it would take. Here's what you'd have to learn. But think about that. Yeah, and there, and there, you've heard those stories. It's kind of extreme uh, looping where I remember somebody retired and she said, okay, I'm gonna do, um, she wanted to do that. She took some kids, like I think in kindergarten, and she followed them all the way through high school. Oh right. So well, that's the model. It's the Waldorf model yeah. of education, right? And, and the thing is, it does work. It's not going to work for everybody, and it means, oh, I'll have to be with a teacher I don't like. Well, then, no. You, you, you know, certainly, people have exit ramps, but as a style, um, it's based on the fact that relationships matter. And, uh, and if you don't have to keep spending all this time building the relationship and the trust is there, uh, it makes a huge difference. So the, this is it I have at the California Labor Management Initiative. And at the back of this, if you click on this card and look at the back, I'll have all of the material here so anybody can see uh, what you were doing. Okay. And you got the Pedro Rivera uh, Yeah, I'll have it. Actually, I, I have a link already to Pedro. I think he already, he, that's a, a message he's given a number of times before. So I had it from a, a, a few weeks ago when he gave it in another setting, but I'll, I'll have the one that he gave to you. And, I, and then I'll give you the link to the video of the one he gave. I'll put that on here too. Um, and I guess, I, just, uh, well, just the last thing I wanted to um, talk about was the, you know, the topic of standardized testing and, right. and it's really, not good for our students. It, it's uh, used to stigmatize them, to label, sort, and segregate yeah. students. And just the, uh, a little bit of the history, how all of this came from No Child Left Behind, 2001, and uh, brought up George Bush. And then there were other things like Race to the Top, which was 2009, Common Core and Smarter Balance. And what I, the point I want to make on this is, you know, those things have been into, put into place to help these children of color and children of poverty. Well, okay, you've had like 19 years of this. Have we seen any improvement? No. So therefore, these failed and let's get rid of them. Right. What, you've, what you have is continued demonizing, yeah. right? So, and, and, and actually the growth of demonizing, right? Yeah. We have an article in here, it looks like the beginning of the end for Americans' obsession with students and standardized tests. That we can only hope that's true, but there is there is now a lot of conversation around that. The opt out programs and a lot of things have come together that uh, that are, are dealing with uh, criticisms of standardized tests from every possible angle, every possible angle, and, and from the utilitarian angle that they don't deliver what they said they were going to deliver to the social justice angle that say they they simply are racist and have a racist um, underpinning to them as well. And Kendi, in it, uh, the uh, anti-racist uh, book author, uh, he has some uh, definite, he gives some history about where all this came from, that we can prove that some humans are, are, are genetically um, yeah. better than others through testing. And that's where this, I'll go back to 1916, where that's the philosophy. And we're still using that, terrible. Right, so now it's time to just recognize it. Uh, I wanted to just point out that I did include in here the National Education Association. They came out with a plan for reopening schools. Okay. So there's that's on here too. I just wanted to point that out. And the only other thing that's on here, just to be of interest to people, is in Dublin, um, Dublin Unified Superintendent resigned this week. And uh, if you and and one of the things that he said, 
was how important it is to uh, work for people you trust and, and the importance of trust both ways that that he needed to be working for a board that trusted him and they needed to have a superintendent that they trusted and he resigned because he uh, didn't feel he had the trust of the majority of the board that's what it really comes down to but it was a very uh, I think it's, it's an interesting point in education today so if you're interested at all the information here including the uh, comments from the board members uh, uh, in Dublin uh, I thought the other night were very powerful and then um, just this is just Mr. Duffy and, and the West Contra Costa reopening survey which has been out there and you working with these fine people this is what the work you're doing with them to do the reopening right and so we'll, we'll get that at some point in the future um, and then oh yeah this is this is still what needs to be taken the at where we need to take action this is there is still you can click on here and get to the take action down here the action network click on that uh, in order to tell Congress to stop giving charter schools this extra money from the PPP that's still that's still going on so if you want to take action that's with the network for public education um, also, the California Federation of Teachers has a take action for fund our future to tax billionaires. And if you're in, if you are, you're um, uh, interested in, in supporting them, it's the same deal. Click on the card, go to the back, and there's the uh, there's the link to be able to send emails to your uh, representatives around uh, additional funding. Uh, and also the same thing. This is governor has not. It yet personally endorsed schools and communities first, which doesn't make any sense to me, and he really does need to do it. So if you want him to endorse that, and that's the uh, closing the commercial loopholes that allows uh, Chevron to pay the same tax they paid in 1972 with, with a, a small increment since then, um, uh, we have to ask Governor Newsom to get on board with everybody else, which he hasn't quite, hasn't done yet. With that, I did want to point out the updates. I put in the update, the COVID update uh, that Mr. Duffy put in. So if anybody wants to see that, they can for West Contra Costa. Um, also, an update on how the budget is going to be done, because the governor finally, uh, uh, they, they came to a compromise. And uh, in the end, there will be the, the funding that will not be cut in California. Funding for education is not going to be cut. So if there is not extra money that comes in from the um, federal government, the uh, districts basically uh, will get an IOU from the state. This is how it worked before when I was on the board. You get, and then, uh, so they tell them they're gonna, it's an IOU, they're gonna defer payment. And so what each of the school districts then has to do is go out and, and borrow the money but they're able to do that. So that's, that's a, a one way that this is gonna be handled. And the details for that are, are in here in the state budget. Uh, a, the, there was an, a state budget equity coalition that sent a letter to the governor to do it. And uh, they, he basically agreed with, with the ACLU and Californians for Justice, the, the folks who are in this coalition and followed what was in that letter. So that's the budget. And then the big, big update is we've been talking here on Between Two Teachers about ACA 5 and ACA 6, and they both are going to be on the California budget in November. It's a very big deal. Uh, opportunity for all. Uh, so what we have is both uh, the Black Caucus and the League of Women Voters all work very hard, along with many other organizations, to do this. And so what you have is um, uh, we're going to be able to uh, do ending affirmative action or, or to bring affirmative action back ending the effects of uh, 209 and allowing uh, the vote uh, for uh, uh, folks that are on parole. Right. So these are the, the two of them. And right. So this is what for weigh in on uh, the affirmative actions and ensuring equal um, opera voting it opportunities and voting rights those are the two so that's a big success this week right a lot happened there 
very good. And I've added this in because this was a week of life transitions. Uh, and the first one was the passing of Randy Enos. And Randy Enos was a very major force in West Contra Costa Unified School District for, uh, for all of his life. He went to Richmond Unified as a child. He went to uh, Mira Vista. Uh, he uh, went, he graduated and went and graduated and then uh, he graduated from Kennedy. And uh, he went on to become a, a teacher. He went to Contra Costa College, came back as a teacher in the school district. He was a coach on many teams. He was a principal, he was a vice principal and principal and ultimately got elected to serve on the school board. And Randy uh, has many, many friends and has done incredible work through our school district over the many years of his service. Um, he developed Alzheimer's at the end of his life and he passed away on Monday. I uh, just wanted to share this with all of you who may have known him and uh, you wanna join me in contributing to the Alzheimer's Association in his name. Um, it, it was a terrible thing. Alzheimer's is a terrible, terrible thing. And uh, when Randy got it, it was, it was such a loss to, ev to everyone, to everyone. So this is the uh, posting that his, his daughter, Courtney, um, placed on, I guess she placed it on Facebook. So that was a goodbye life transition. And then there's a welcome transition. Because somebody arrived. As Randy left, Amaya arrived. And tell us about Amaya, Grandma. Oh, yes. My first grandchild. And her name is Amaya Christina Ocasio. And she came yesterday, 4 o'clock in the morning. And everybody is just thrilled. The two grandmas. And uh, she's going to call me Abuela. So that. Abuela. Yeah, and, uh, oh, my gosh. We're just so thrilled. I guess because the time we're living in this bundle of joy just made us all so happy and she's beautiful and you know you can't go to the hospital and watch and uh, oh but um yeah pictures videos <laughs> all right well we'll have a picture of maya if her mommy says that we can share a picture of her with all of you we will we will try to do that um so this was this was a week of, of transitions now, I don't even know if we have, did, did Carlos come up? I did, I forgot to ask him, I'm sorry. That's all right, but there, we just want to remember Carlos. Carlos is also a very busy guy doing a lot of incredible things uh, to support everybody. So finally, right, what Carlos is. is some shout outs later as well. And he's uncle, he's Tio Carlos now, right? He's so excited as well. So please like, um, subscribe, and, and, uh, and, and share the episode. Uh, we appreciate your watching all the way to the end. Uh, let us know if you have any comments, and uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah, I got oh. Do you have something you want to, you want to say? Go ahead. Shout out to oh. uh, Dawit Vasquez. Yes. Mala. He's our trust, student trustee. And I just wanted to shout out to him. Uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful uh, youth leader. And maybe we'll uh, interview him at some time. Absolutely. We're going to get back to teacher talk and do some interviews with, uh, with important education leaders. And Dawit is one of them. Dawit is a, an education leader for the future. Okay. Okay. And now we can say, see you next week.